All right, now. Looking, looking down, and I'll just give you an audible cue. Let's say go. Okay. And then I should wait a second or two? At that point, you're just one second, and you're off. All right. This is Pastor M.D. Lewis, the speaker for the, the Bible interpreter videotapes. <clears throat> this morning we want to take just a moment to review two of these very significant statements regarding the great plan of salvation. I call your attention again to the statement here on the board. To this day, there are still aspects of truth that are dimly seen and connections that are not understood, and great depths <clears throat> in the law of God <clears throat> that are uncomprehended. Now, that is one of the main ideas of these particular studies, is to give you a, a greater comprehension in the extent and the particular depth into every person's life that this law deals with. And there is immeasurable breadth, dignity, and glory in the law of God, and yet the religious world has set it, this law aside. And that is a great calamity. In fact, the time has come when one speaks of the law of God, referring to the Ten Commandments, there is sort of a wave of opposition in the lives of the people, as if it is something that's going to deprive, to deprive you, see? It's going to deprive you, when in reality, it will give you everything. It will give you everything. So, <clears throat> when one takes a look at nature or looks at the Bible, and you see that's exactly what this statement says, that God is the creator of the world. He is the author of the Bible. So whether you look, in fact, probably more people will look at nature than look at the Bible. The great God who has created the mountains has garmented them with green and flowers, who has put the sparkle in the brook and the glimmer in the dewdrop and in the magnificence of the starry heavens, is endeavoring to make contact with you. He's endeavoring to make contact with you. In fact, he will make the first move toward you. As it says in Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verse 2, sin has separated between you and your God. And God is going to make the first move. So turn with me in your Bibles to the 12th chapter of the book of John. And I call your attention to this very significant statement of the 32nd verse, John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Now, it's very, very important that we see the significance of that statement. Sin has separated man from God. There is little or no communication. So inasmuch as sin, which is the life of men, has separated them from God, then God must make the first move, and he does. I, if I be lifted up, that is, if I will assume all the mistakes of your life, all the detrimental effects of the statements and the facts of your life, and pay the penalty for them which separates man from God, that will allow me to make the first move towards the human race. And God makes the first move in the fact that Christ has assumed the responsibility of every sin every person has committed, which has the tendency to separate them from God, 
the fact that he pays the penalty for those sins gives him the opportunity and the right to make the first move towards the sinner. And he says, I, if I be lifted up, that is, if I be crucified, the word lifted up in the Hebrew context and the background means he would be crucified. The same as in our early American history when they spoke of stringing men up, many times for horse thievery, they understood exactly what it meant to be hung. So the term strung, string up or to be strung up had reference to hanging. So the term lifted up in the biblical context has the meaning of crucifixion. Christ would be lifted up from the earth toward heaven to show that he is the contact that heaven is going to make, the initial contact that heaven is going to make with the individuals. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Now that's very, very important. How will God, by his initiative, to draw all men to him is by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. And it is all contingent upon the fact that Christ would be lifted up and die for the sins of the people. Sin drives out the communication of God with man. It drives out the Holy Spirit from the life of the individual. When Adam sinned, he lost the divine power by which he was clothed, by which he had contact with God. Now to reestablish that as could we say, hotline or communication with God is the purpose, the initial purpose of the plan of salvation so that God has communication with the individuals. I, if I be lifted up, which means I, if I assume the responsibility of all the sins of all the persons who have ever lived and pay the penalty for those transgressions, which is the great obstacle that thwarts the relationship of God with people, then God has the right to start a communication with the individuals. Look at this text in Romans, the fifth chapter, very, very significant in revealing the heart of God, the character of God in relationship to the plan of salvation, the redemption of the human race. The fifth chapter of the book of Romans. In this particular text, he says, Verse 6, for when we, were, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For when we were yet without strength, in due time. Now the strength that we ha are lacking is the divine power of deity in the individual's life, in the person of the Holy Spirit. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And now the, the text that I think is so very, very significant. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we were what? Enemies. You see, God takes the first move. He must make the first move because sin separates man from God and will continue to separate as long as man's a sinner and so the, the gap between the two gets greater and greater and greater. Unless God makes the first move, there will be no relationship of individuals with heaven. And God does make the first move even while we were yet sinners, even while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, here comes to a very, very significant point. Uh, sometimes people may think because man is a sinner 
and has violated the great character of God, which is unselfishness. That God would only deal with him on the basis of his correction of his conduct, the correction of his life, the improvement of his moral quality before God will deal with him. This is not the case. God knows where sinners are. And he makes the first move. Now you understand the first move that God is going to make towards sinners is, uh, is by law, of course. And as we've said the other uh, lecture and study, there are three laws in the Bible. <clears throat> there is the law of nature, which I have re already referred to, the great creator of all the things in the world. <clears throat> then uh, uh, we may think of the law of Moses and then the law of the Ten Commandments. Now, you understand this one reveals the love of God. Obviously, all the law is based on one factor, love to God, love to a fellow man. So you can say love is the factor. Now keep in mind, love is giving to others no matter what it costs the person who makes the giving. So this reveals the love of God. If this reveals the love of God, this law reveals that God makes the first move towards sinners to be lifted up and die. That's in this law, not this one. So if this one is love, this one is even a greater manifestation of love. For Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for others. And that's in this. Now you understand there's death in this one too. I will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate. But when the person pays that penalty, he is gone and extinct forever. So to have a exhibition of death, to allow the sinner to live, that's in this law. Now keep in mind, this law today is the, uh, the ordinance of communion, and I'll just put down like, for abbreviation, communion. Baptism, foot washing, and the bread and wine of the communion service. This is equivalent to this in the Old Testament. So when I'm speaking of the law of Moses, I hope that you will take in both of these factors. Because this reveals that God makes the first move towards the individual. Now, absolutely, this reveals the love of God because all nature is featured in giving some aspect of its function to some other aspect of nature. As I mentioned the other day, when we exhale the carbon dioxide, the natural processes take care of it, reconvert it to oxygen so people can live. Not only that, uh, God has created the bees and they are attracted to flowers either by smell or by sight, maybe both, and when they go in to get what they want, nectar or pollen or whatever it is, they sometimes fertilize the plants. So while they're getting their what? Giving. All nature is fabricated on that basis. And as I said the other day, God purposely fabricated it on that basis to reveal the great definite attribute of God's character in giving his life for others. So all of these reveal the love of God. But I want to particularly emphasize this particular uh, law here because this is the one that reveals I, if I be lifted up, that is if I be crucified, if I am lifted up above the earth towards heaven to indicate that he is establishing the communication of heaven and earth, I will draw all men unto myself. Now how he's going to do this is very important for us to see. For while we were enemies, God what? paid the penalty for our transgressions. 
so that he makes the first move towards the individual. Now, let me call your attention to the 10th verse of this Romans 5th chapter. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We shall be saved by his life. Now, I want to point out a very significant factor of our discussion this morning. God does not deal with man in the sense that now you are a sinner, you have violated the laws of heaven, you are in rebellion against the government of heaven, and I will have to be very, very judicious in how I deal with you to recover you. I will recover you on the basis of your exhibition of repentance, your exhibition of portraying the characteristics of heaven. Uh, I will uh, deal with you on the basis that you give evidence that you want to come back and all these factors. <clears throat> this is not the basic concept of God in dealing with the human race. The fact that he has paid the penalty and has been lifted up for all of our sins gives him the right to draw all men to himself by the power of the divine Holy Spirit. He will draw them. He takes the, makes the first move. He will draw them unto himself. Now, he can only draw them unto himself in a very meaningful way if he first establishes the merits of the individual. Now, as I say, this is very, very important. Because God, God is not going to continually sort of uh, have a, a tie or a rope or a string or some uh, endeavor of connection with man and just keep drawing him while he's sinning, 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 sinning and keep drawing him. Because sin, sin, sin has separated him and sin, sin, sin cannot bring him back. Do you see that? So God has got to establish the merits of the individual before this drawing will be absolutely successful. So, this is a very, very significant factor. So, if the God is endeavoring to draw the individuals to himself, this drawing will not be completely successful and meaningful unless God, in the drawing, establishes the merits and character of the individual. Now, this is what he does. It says, while we were enemies, he died for us, that he might reconcile us to God. And much more, being reconciled, we are saved by his life. So one of the first things in God's contact with the individual, I will draw, if I be lifted up, I will draw them. And if the person is affected by that drawing power and turns to God, then God does the, the next great significant factor. He makes the person perfect. Now, the first is, by his act of death, he has the tendency to draw the individual. In other words, in the mind, the mind of the person turns toward God. As if to say he sees the beautiful mountains and he must know it took a lot of power to stack up that earth in that manner, and it took a great deal of power to clothe it with trees and grass and flowers. And if he's attracted to that fact that there's a great power, there's a great God of nature, and his mind is dealing with that particular factor, that indicates he's being drawn to God, or any aspect of nature that he sees and appreciates and has a sense of, of its beauty and glory, he's being attracted. Now, the next thing, if he is attracted to God, to give his life and surrender himself to God, immediately God establishes his character as if he had never left heaven. Now, that's the significance of this statement. When, men, when man fell by transgression, the law was not changed, but a remedial system was established to bring him back to obedience, that remedial system that he established is this, not this. Now, you understand the character of love of this was manifest in the love of this law. But this is the law that reveals him lifted up. And this is the law that reveals he's making a contact with the individual to draw him by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul labors this in the book of Galatians, which we will turn to.
before we finish the study. Am I making myself known and I want you to see God's love for the human race? He makes the first move. And his first move is to draw the individual in his mind to the realization of God, the realization of his character and love, the realization of his intent to redeem the human race. And if that person will respond to that drawing to the extent that he will surrender his life to God and accept Christ as his personal savior, the first thing that God does in the individual's life is to restore his character as holy as the character of angels, the characters of God, the character of righteousness. He doesn't say, now look, I'll give you a little bit of the kingdom of God. I'll give you a little bit of righteousness. And then we'll see how that works and we'll deal with you on the basis of how you respond to that. See, God is so anxious to redeem the human race that he died for their sins and he will be just as willing not only to die for the human race and pay the penalty for their sins, but to establish their character on the basis of heaven immediately. And then work out how you can retain that perfection by sanctification and entrance into heaven. Uh, there's a tremendous statement uh, in the writings of the church that indicates the whole affair. It's found in the Bible Commentary, Book 7, page 908, column 2, about three-fourths of the way down the page. Now listen very closely because this is what I'm saying. Justification means the saving of a soul from perdition. Now justification, when the person is being drawn and he is drawn by the revelation of the lamb that was slain in the Moses system. That lamb, as John the Baptist said, this is the lamb of God that what? Takes away the sins of the world. If a person accepts that factor, then the next move, he justifies the individual. That is, he makes him righteous and gives him a character fully, completely, as the character of angels, the righteousness of God, the character of virtue and unselfishness. Give it to him totally, completely. Then he begins to work out how the person can retain it, keep it, be improved by it, and develop a character like heaven. But he gives him what he has lost completely and fully at one move. Now this is very important. This is all revealed in the law of Moses, or we say today, in the ordinances. See, when the person is baptized, he, submitted, he submerges himself in water. Water is the word of God. So when you submerge yourself in the word of God, you are as if you are dead because you stop breathing, you're gone, you're out of sight. You're covered up with water, a symbol of death. You don't breathe, you better not breathe while you're under the water. See, you're dead. We are buried with Christ, as it says in baptism. See, you're dead. And how long would it be before you come back to life again? <laughs> Just but a flash of a moment. You're brought up out of the water to new life. Now that's what I say, that new life is justification. And that new life is the obedience of Christ to the Ten Commandments. He gives that obedience to you as a gift and justifies you on his conduct, not yours. Now I probably ought to reread some of those statements uh, we had yesterday. Justification means the saving of a soul from perdition, that he may obtain sanctification. That he may what? Attain sanctification. Sanctification in Hebrew is the word sanctify, righteousness. It's also the word for saint. And when it speaks of Christ as the Holy One, it's using that same word. To, that he may obtain sanctification, and through sanctification, the life of heaven. He accepts the, the fact that Christ died for him. 
he accepts the justification of Christ giving him his obedience, and then he moves into a situation of sanctification, which is that the total exhibition in his person, in his conduct, of the character Christ gave him to justify him. Now, God is not going to save the person who says, now I'm going to keep a check on you as to your prog progress of living. And when you reach the point of sanctification, we will save you. He doesn't do that. He saves the individual on the, the moment he turns to God in a complete surrender of his life and accepts the person of Christ as his Savior. He saves him at that moment on the justification of the perfection of Christ's conduct in his place. There's where he is saved. Then he produces, begins to progress in the preparation to re-enter heaven. But God considers him as having the character of heaven as if he had never gone. Let me, uh, let me finish this, and I want to read that the verse, and it confirms that. The life of heaven is the result of justification. Justification means that the conscience purged from dead works is placed where it can receive the blessings of sanctification. Now that is of the utmost importance to understand these revelations of the laws. There are three laws. The law of nature, which people are aware of, probably more aware than the other two. Their body functions by laws of nature. In fact, their jaws operate by the laws of nature. And when you take food in and masticate and chew it, it's by the laws of nature. And when you swallow it and it goes into your stomach into a chemical digestive process, obviously that's not your functioning. That is the processes of nature. So people are more aware of this law probably than all others. This one is revealing the character of God's love and the consequence if a person doesn't match up to it. I will visit the iniquities of the fathers on the children of those who hate, and finally they will be destroyed. And that death will be eternal. It is this law or the ordinances of communion service that reveal God's move towards the individual to make the first move. And that move is that he died for your sins, and if I be lifted up, I will, what? Draw men unto me. So God makes the first move. And if they will respond to his drawing in a total submission of their life, he will justify them in a moment by restoring to them the character of heaven, completely, totally, in its fullness. Not in a piecemeal affair, but in a totality. Then he will work out how you can keep it and improve it by making it a part of your conduct and your total life. Now that's exactly what this statement is saying. Now let me read it again. Justification means the saving of a soul from perdition, that he may obtain sanctification, and through sanctification the life of heaven. Justification means that the conscience is purged from dead works is placed where it can receive the blessings of sanctification. The conscience, which is the mind that is turned toward God. See, now I am uh, definitely interested in revealing to you in the Law of Moses, which is the ordinances, how God is going to do this. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, the second chapter. The book of Hebrews, the second chapter. And notice, <coughs> excuse me, notice the great, the great truths of this person. Now remember what he's endeavoring to do is to cleanse your conscience of any guilt and sanctify it in the perfection of heaven. Now that takes a long process. Verse 9, Hebrews 2, verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Now, I want you to see that this uh, revelation here, that Christ would be made lower than the angels, that is, he would be made a man, as you'll see these verses say. That is God's first move towards man. To draw him 
is to send Christ in the person of the human individual. Now, this is a very technical factor, and so we ought to dismiss it for the, for the moment in the fact that Christ became a human being, born into the human family, so that he could have contact with the human family. And in that sense, he will start the drawing process and the justification, the sanctification process. So he says, uh, he's made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, you should uh, immediately associate the fact that he should taste death for every man as, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Verse 11, I'm not reading them all. Well, I should read verse 5. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And that suffering is, I, if I be lifted up, if I be crucified for the sins of the world. For both he that sanctifieth, and they who are sanctified, are one. Now, if you want the whole totality of theology in one word, it would be in the word one. The whole totality of salvation is in the fact that Christ would make the first move come into the human race and assume their humanity. And by assuming the oneness of their humanity, if he could get them to understand that he has their humanity and they accept that fact, then their humanity united with his humanity and his Holy Spirit and his deity, they will become one. And on this oneness, God is going to save the human race. Now that is probably ascends to the apex of all theology. The fact that God would come, become one with man, so the man became one with him. And in the oneness with Christ, God will accept the merits of Christ in behalf of the individual. And inasmuch as he's one with the individual, what Christ attains, the individual will receive the credit. And on that basis, God will save the human race. Now, you cannot overemphasize that in your comprehension of the plan of salvation. In the oneness, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. And that dwelling is the oneness with the individual. He who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them what? Brothers. Now, you people here could call each other brothers because of what? Your common parentage, you see. And I have brothers, and I can call them brothers because we have common parents. And that is very, very important. Now, I want to go on to verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Now, that's true, isn't it? Humanity is partakers of flesh and blood of their parents. Inasmuch as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Likewise, as you take flesh and blood, likewise he took flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, the law of Moses will reveal that, see. The law of Moses and the ordinances will reveal that the law of sin and death is an aspect of the law of God, of the Ten Commandments. I will visit the iniquity of the fathers on their children. But this whole process of the iniquities of the fathers visited on the children and finally death is instituted, inaugurated by Satan. Now it's a part of the law of God, a part of the law of God that he would never want to be exhibited. But Satan initiated the exhibition. So sin and all of its results are at the foot of Satan. He's responsible for them. But inasmuch as sin is designated by the law of God, God bears responsibility and he assumes that responsibility in paying the sin for every person who's ever sinned. <clears throat> for he took part of the same 
and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage, the bondage of death and sin. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on the seed of Abraham. Now the word seed in the original text here, I've got it written in the margin of my Bible, is the word sperma. So seed is sperma, is sperm, it's of the sperm of Abraham, and of course that is designated in the Bible. Now here comes a verse that's very important. Verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In how many ways? In all things. Now the moment it says all things, you still must, you still must hold a reservation. When it says all things, meaning all things of men, you have to make a reservation, which does not do uh, any ill to the, to the language of the Bible or even our own language. He is in all things like his brethren, in but one exception. Not by his will did he ever choose to sin. All the human race has, he did not. Now with that exception, in all things he was made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and a faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, to reconcile. The word reconcile, if it were in Hebrew, and of course the Greek reflects it anyhow, is the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. It is called the lid of reconciliation because there is where the blood revealed by the law of Moses went. And there is where the, the, the grape juice of the communion service will finally be placed. Making reconciliation by blood and righteousness. Now just keep in mind if you want to use the parallel, the lid on the Ark of the Covenant, where the Ten Commandments were kept, was solid gold. The only piece of furniture, solid gold. That solid gold is the perfect character of Christ. So the blood that went on that character of Christ is the blood that you results from your sins, and when that blood achieves its final work, it will cleanse the conscience of iniquity. Now, I want to, to bring that point to your attention this morning. Uh, turn with me to the book of Peter. The book of Peter, the first chapter, the first book of Peter. And uh, I'm reading in the third chapter. First Peter, the first book of Peter, the third chapter, I'm reading verse 21. The like figure, uh, whereunto even baptism doth also save us. Now you see when they speak of baptism, they're speaking of the law of, of uh, the communion, baptism, foot washing, and communion. And the same thing is revealed in the law of Moses in the Old Testament. doth also reveal the baptism that now saves us. God, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now that is not an easy text. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, or the law of Moses, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answering of a good conscience toward God. Now let me emphasize that a bit by calling your attention to the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter. And in this ninth chapter, he's talking about the two sanctuaries, the one built on earth and the one that's built in heaven. And the one on earth refers to Christ's person on the earth. 
Verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all, that is to the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was and the final atonement is made, was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing. That is, while the ones on earth were standing, this was not fully revealed. But when Christ died on the cross and the veil was rent from top to bottom, which opened up the last door, then the viewpoint into the most holy place where Christ was, was made possible. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now in the 10th chapter, verse 4, it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. And that's reasonable, isn't it? That the sins of the individual couldn't be abrogated and atoned for and completely dismissed from his life by the blood of an animal. And I might so say, nor by grape juice. See, referring to the communion service of the little glass of grape juice. Could your conscience be cleansed and perfected by just drinking grape juice? No, no more than by offering the blood of the Lamb of the Law of Moses. See, so it's not possible that grape juice or a little piece of bread would establish person's salvation. They are only symbols of what will establish your salvation. So whether it's the law of Moses or communion, see, it doesn't make any difference. Now he says here, the blood of animals, and I should add, grape juice, could not cleanse your conscience. But he says, how much more, this is verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? Now, when does that first process start? The purging of your conscience. I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He does it by the power of the Holy Spirit, which we'll take up in the next study. But he will draw you by the power of the Holy Spirit to accept the fact that while you were an enemy of God, he died for you to take care of your penalty, which is separating you from God. And he can establish the communication with you. And he will then start drawing you with a cord or a rope or some material to himself. And the moment that you yield your to life totally to receive that drawing, he will give you his perfect character, the complete character of heaven, to justify you. What for? To cleanse your conscience from sin. And how will he do it? immediately the moment you do it. Well, does that mean that your life will never incur sin anymore? No. So he said, not the removing of the filth of the flesh, totally, completely, entirely, which will only be done in sanctification. In other words, God is getting you out a clear conscience while you're still a sinner. Now, I should make this very clear while you're still a sinner. See, Not the sinner you were before you ever responded to God's drawing. But when he starts to draw you, as the Bible says in 1 John, he who says that he's a born-again Christian and does not sin is a what? Is a liar. The truth is not in him. See, now, the sins that the saint commits after he has accepted justification are the sins I'm dealing with in this aspect of the cleansing conscience. Now, don't get the confused with the sins that the person has who has never accepted God or Christ as his personal Savior. Now, don't confuse it with that. You see, what God does for you is give you immediate service. And what you need is your conscience cleansed from sin that the factor of guilt will not plague you and bother you all your life. In other words, he gives you the, the, the life of heaven so that you can enjoy it immediately. Even though you may still sin in your life, but because of the blood, God, heaven attributes the fact as if you did not sin. First John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God doth not sin. Now I could turn around and say what? He does still sin. But he does not sin in the fact that he believes in the blood of Christ 
who has paid the penalty for your sins and will cleanse his conscience. So God gives you a conscience of heaven, so to speak, the moment that you turn from him, turn from sin and turn to him. And as long as you keep repenting and confessing your sins in all sincerity, they are continually washed clean and your conscience is established as if you were a perfect man. Now you understand, in the course of time, he will absolutely cleanse your conscience by the blood that goes on the lid in the final atonement. But what I'm saying to you, he gives you immediate service, immediate service. I will draw all men unto me. And he does it by cleansing their conscience. Now, notice what it says then. For if the blood of bulls and of goats, now I'm reading uh, Hebrews 9:13. If the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. Now you understand the blood of bulls and the ashes of a heifer <coughs> could not sanctify the person's life. Only as you believe that the blood of that bull, the blood of that goat, the ash of that heifer refers to Christ. And I may so say, you could not be cleansed by taking a little piece of bread and drinking a little grape juice in the communion service and have your conscience cleansed and your penalty paid. No. Only as you accept the fact that these symbols refer to what Christ did for you. Now you understand that is all in the law of what? Moses. The law of the communion service. It is by faith that you are saved. So he goes on to say, not by the blood of bulls, for the sanctifying or the purifying of the flesh. Now you understand that the purifying of the flesh that he's talking about here by taking these symbols of justification. <coughs> Excuse me, God will cleanse your conscience. So the fact that your conscience is cleansed and you have the, the assurance that God has paid the penalty for your sins in Christ's blood and established your justification by his conduct. And your conscience is aware of that. Your conscience is clear that you are the Son of God, even though all the filth of the flesh has not been removed. Now, how much could God do more for us? You see, he is banking. He is banking on the fact that if you have been a sinner and have experienced all the ill of sin, of selfishness and what it does, that if God delivered you from it, and you could in, in time be totally delivered from it and return to heaven, you'd never sin and leave it for eternity. Now that's what he's banking on. So that's why the, the program of sanctification takes a period of time. And even if you don't achieve sanctification before he dies, he'll give it to you anyhow and resurrect you on the merits of it. With the proposition that he understands that if you were made sanctified by your intent, not against your will, but by your intent, and if you experienced return to heaven and sanctification, knowing what sin has been on this life, you will never, never, never sin again. Now that's what he's banking on. Now there are some people who have achieved sanctification on this earth. Enoch and Elijah and Christ. And in time the 144,000. So it will be demonstrated that it is achievable in the plan of salvation. But he will save you on the merits of it even though he did not fully achieve it and accomplish it. So that he gives you what? A clear conscience even while you have a, a recognition and a cognizance and awareness that you still sin. What more could God do for us than he is doing? You can never overestimate the love of God in his purpose to achieve the redemption of your soul. Again. You can never fully overestimate the love of God in dealing with the redemption of your soul. Now, do you folks want to take just a minute or two of any questions that may have been stirred up in your mind that I might be able to clear before we leave? Just a matter of a minute or so. Does anyone have a question they'd like to take up? 
so that I could make this beneficial to you if you have any question you'd like, just for a matter of a minute or so. Now, I know where there may come some opposition. You know that I have some familiarity with the plan of salvation and with the Adventist theology. What's that? How would you classify Moses? Exhibition of Christ in human flesh. I would have said that um, yeah, Enoch and Elisha and Christ. Oh, 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 Moses, he died a sinner. They did not. Well, they never died. <laughs> they achieved sanctification in this life. Moses did not. Raised to the yeah, they raised him. Yeah. Yes, they sent an angel down to resurrect him. Now, that does not mean that every person who goes into the grave is not sanctified. I couldn't establish that. See? Oh, yes, and when, when he wanted to go into the land of promise, why was he not permitted? Sin. Now, if he had achieved complete victory over that, would God have held that as an as a object lesson against him? No, how did, he, how did he let Enoch and Elijah? They sinned too. But they finally didn't. Do you see? There's two levels, two functional levels of sanctification. Yes. One is the commencement and the other is the total achievement and all in between. See? But salvation takes place in the in life of the individual before that process begins to function. And that's the thing that's important to us, isn't it? You're saved by justification, not sanctification. See? You're saved by this, not that. Is that clear to you? You're saved by this, not that. That would be a little bit uh, questioned in the Adventist theology, wouldn't it? Huh? Would that be your impression? See? Especially when you use Enoch and Elisha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, now, if I would say also that God will save you on the basis of your clear conscience of justification, rather on the reality of the filth of your flesh, that too might be questioned in Adventist theology. I think the beauty of the beauty of the presentation is always the emphasis of God's continual, yes. never-ending love, not. The beauty, uh, the beauty cannot be derived from what human being, how human beings respond. No, 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 no. It will completely under underestimate the quality, the value, the extent of his love. The while we were yet enemies, he died for us. And while we, now, I, uh, this would be a difficult thing to say, while we are sinners, he'll save us. Now, if I should stand in the, in the, on the roster in the pulpit in the church and say that, what would be the reaction of the audience? <clears throat> Some of those things have to be said, however, uh, because they are true. Our theology is not necessarily our verbal description of it. And oftentimes we have to have a range of verbal description so every mind is mm -hmm. touched by it. But if I should say God will save us on the basis of a clear conscience despite the filthiness of our flesh. You're saying the same thing, but it sounds better. Huh? You're saying the same thing, but it sounds better. Yeah, see? What is the word uh, conversion then? When God gives you the... Convert means to turn your mind away from sin. Okay, then when you and your mind accept the sacrifice of Christ in that moment, you convert it, or it's when you receive the clean conscience. The no, the clean conscience. Then when you're yeah. Convert. See, a person has to make a turn and apply something to himself. Like he said, you have to step through the door. Now, you can't stand there in front of the door and say, I know that this door enters into salvation or justification. See, I know it. He will not be saved until he steps through. You know, I understand now when these criminals and dopes, dopatics give a testimony. I understand more now what, yeah. what happened. Yeah, we well, see those people, they're in a very, very bad spot and they had to make a very, very definite move. <clears throat> but that statement in Peter, he will save us on a clear conscience that Christ's justification did for us 
despite the fact that the converted, born-again sinner still sins. So he even is saying that you don't sin, for he who is born again doth not commit sin because his seed remains in him. Justification remains in his life, and God's basing him on uh, judgment on the uh, fact of his justification, not his conduct. Now, I think the Adventists are accepting this much, much better in the last 10 or 15 years, don't you? See, I've been here 35 years and keen and taught. But it is possible for a man to lose, so to say, that, that clean conscience. Oh, absolutely. Lose it. Absolutely. He can only continue it when he is continuing in his general trend towards Christ. Now, he may make certain deviations back and come back, see. I am making a study. I run into opposition when I, when I lecture sometime, and one of them is on the basis of the life of David. And I have been making now a very definite study of Saul, David, and Solomon. All of these men were converted without a doubt. Saul was converted and left, never came back. Solomon was converted, left, and came back. David was converted and never left. And that's the one I run into difficulty with. Yeah, what? I was going to say that's the one you done. Yeah, that's the one I run into difficulty with. And the, the, one of the last trips I had, they brought that up in a very distinctive way. And I said, well, I don't have all my books here. Let me have this little selected message of these little two volumes selected. And in it, on regard to David and the Bathsheba deal, it says he was not an unconverted man. Twice it said that. And I never knew that till I read it in that place. He was not an unconverted man. Now that's hard to swallow. But there are many texts in the Bible that say it. David kept my commandments, followed me with all his heart. He only did that which was right. The greatest text in the whole scripture. Well, listen, I don't want to keep you men here unduly beyond your time. But if you have objections, it sharpens my mind if I can, if I can answer them, see? And that's important. I think one of the reasons why some of this is far more acceptable now is because you have a far greater range and flexibility of individuals who are going to speak out and who are going to correct. Uh, that's correct. Share, as before you didn't. That's right. That's correct. And uh, in fact...